Well, welcome to St Matthew's on this Good Friday morning. Please stand. As dreadful as the death of Jesus was, it did not take God by surprise. It was all part of his wonderful plan of salvation that had been revealed through prophets like the prophet Isaiah, who 700 years before Jesus came said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So let's sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Please be seated. Well, welcome to St Matthew's on this Good Friday service, uh, both to those of you who are joining us here in the building and those of you who are joining us online. It's wonderful to be coming together. For those of us who are with us as guests uh, today, my name is Andrew Graham, I'm one of the ministers here. And the centrepiece of what we're doing this morning is listening to the accounts of the last steps of Jesus on the way to the cross, right through to his last breath. Uh, we'll be hearing that from the scriptures, and Peter Kerr uh, will be preaching to us, walking us down those last steps, and, and helping us reflect on the significance of what it was that Jesus was doing. In addition to that, of all days... Uh, today is a day to share in the Lord's Supper, where we recall the way in which Jesus prepared his first disciples for what was about to take place. 
But before we go any further, we're going to turn to God in prayer, and I'll lead us firstly in some special Good Friday prayers, and then invite you to join me to pray the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught his first disciples. Please bow your head as I lead, your heads as I, I lead us. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for giving us your only son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly living. May we always receive the benefits of his sacrifice thankfully and also daily seek to follow the steps of his life for the honour of his name. And gracious God, you've made all people and you hate nothing that you've made, nor desire the death of sinners, but rather that they should turn to Christ and live. Have mercy on all who do not know you and who do not profess faith in Christ and bring them back into your fold, that we may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again, so please stand as we join our, our little choir in singing In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Please stand. Please be seated. The first Bible reading today comes from Mark 15, verses 16 to 26, which can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 1021. I'll give you just a moment to open that.
The soldiers led Jesus away to the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his clothes. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Divided up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice on the charge against him read, The King of the Jews.
Today's second reading follows on in Mark's account, chapter 15, verses 27 to 41. This can be found on page 1022. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely This man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. Good morning, friends. Let's, uh, I feel to pray, so let's pray and then we'll, we'll have a look at this passage together. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, uh, this morning, on this day, would you transport us, all of us, back to that day? Would you help us to see Those of us who have seen it before, would you help us to see it again with fresh eyes? Those of us who haven't seen it before, to see it with new eyes, what it is that you did for us on that day. Help us to feel the weight of it, but help us to feel the weight of your love that just surpasses all of our understanding. Father, we ask that we would not leave this place the same, but we would be changed. For your glory and honour we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I would like to start with a brief timeline, a timeline of a day that changed the world. It was a December day, a December day in Berlin, and it was cold that day. On the 19th of December, 1938, it dropped to 16 degrees below freezing. I know that, it was the coldest day of the year, I looked it up. And on that day, two men, they woke up in two different locations. Both had slept the night beside their wives. So one man, his name was Fritz, he had been married for just over a year at this point, and Otto had been married for 25 years. Before work, uh, one man, he had a more simple breakfast, so he had a bread roll with marmalade, some black coffee. The other man, he went for a selection of cheeses and salamis, and uh, he had two soft-boiled eggs, some juice, Both men, they dressed in scarves and gloves as they left for work. They kissed their wives and out the front door they went. 86 years ago, they went to work in this building, actually, at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry. They would have walked through that front door, actually. Both of them, they worked side by side all day long. And on that day, 
in that building, there was an event that changed the world forever. And some of you will know this, nuclear fission was discovered. Almost by accident, they discovered that out of a little bit of material, they could produce an enormous amount of energy. That's my layperson's description. I read in one book, it was the most significant event in the history of the world. And then I picked up another book, another commentator, another author, and they had something different to say. They actually said the most significant event in the history of the world was actually 10 years before this, in 1928, when Dr. Fleming, he returned from a holiday, back, came back to his farm to find his petri dish, had a bunch of mould in it, which was putting up a serious fight against some pretty serious bacteria. Penicillin, of course, was the result of that. So that was another book. Over the last few months here at St Matthews, we've been tracking a different book. Another book from a different commentator, a different author. This is not an author from Harvard, this is the author of Heaven and Earth. And 1900 years before nuclear fission and penicillin, God himself spoke of an event that took place, not in this building, but in and around this building. And it was an event that changed the world forever. It was an event so massive that it shifted the spiritual tectonic plates of humanity and continues to rumble through history to this very, very day. It is the day described in Mark 15. You see, in Mark 15, we are given a timeline, not of one man on a farm or of two men in Berlin, but of one man in Jerusalem. And it is a timeline, friends, make no mistake, it is a timeline of terror that transformed the world. That's what I see. I wonder what you see as we look at this together. You see, for just the few moments that we have this morning, I just want us to mentally jet back 2,000 years and hit the eject button over this day and just to glide down over it. That's what we're going to do. So at around 4 a.m., as the city slept, a single man, a compassionate man, was swept silently but viciously. He was seized from a park, we're told, while praying and taken to the palace of a priest. And it was freezing that morning. So I'm not talking like Berlin cold, but it was cold. We know that this man, he wouldn't have had gloves on, he wouldn't have had a scarf, nothing like that. His fingertips, they would have been cold. His toes, they would have been cold, maybe even numb. But not as numb as his face when at around 5.30 a.m., as the birds start to sing, he cops a blindfold and his first beating. That's what we're told. At a time of the morning when many Christians these days, we have our quiet time with the Lord... Here we have these religious men having a very different time with the Lord. This beating went on for about the time it would take you to watch an episode of Home and Away. That was the first one. At around 6am, as the city was starting to wake up, so people, they're starting to push their carts around. Some families, they're having breakfast, I'm sure. Commerce is happening outside the Roman palace. The Christ is being moved around inside the Roman palace. So for around two hours, he gets knocked around like a ball in a political pinball machine with two ruling roamers on the toggles. They don't know what to do with him. They have no idea until they do. We're not exactly sure what time it was, but it was likely at around 8 a.m. Jesus is taken back out of the palace. He's taken to what was called a judgment seat. He is stood there, and when most people are deciding what to have for their breakfast... There is another man that is deciding what will happen to this man, the God-man. The man who brought gentleness into the world is going to be taken gruesomely out of the world. Not humanely, horribly. Crucifixion, the worst. The day continues in the 16th sentence. This is the story we picked up in our readings today. And so it's just after 8 a.m. And Jesus at this stage is led back into the palace... So he goes back into the palace and he's moved to where a soldier's barracks would have been inside the palace. And here's the picture. At this point, all of his friends have filed out. 600 soldiers, they file in. It's a whole company, we're told. So Jesus, he wasn't alone. He actually wasn't alone in his final hours. He had plenty of company. This is just not the company you'd want to have canapes with. Uh, the soldiers' barracks are bursting with so many men. 
It's like they're dealing with a lion and not the Lord of Peace. It's so over the top. It's like if you took 20 pest controllers with flamethrowers to deal with a butterfly. It's, it's just so over the top. That's the image for this most precious gentleman. So for about 30 minutes, you'll notice the soldiers, they get, to, they get some privacy to play out what can only be described as a brutal fantasy, almost like a game. There really is no... Wiggles or Thomas the Tank Engine version of what is happening here. It is that gruesome. The Messiah is treated like a mouse. He is maimed by a mob. He is struck again and again, we're told. So outside the palace, people are getting on with their day. Inside the palace, there is something gruesome taking place that will change every other day forever. So that's the picture. And you'll notice they play dress-ups with him, almost like an ancient Ken doll, but they're not having fun. There's a robe, more abuse, basically for 30 minutes. While they're not abusing him, they're, they're just laughing at him. It's all horrible. The crown is horrible. It really is. And there's something... It really strikes me every time I read this passage, there is something deeply sinister about this crown. And I think I figured out this week what it is. In their presence is the one who made the plant that is producing the thorns that is now pressed on his head and punctures his skin. Basically, the picture, we have the king of creation being hurt by his children using his creation. There's something deeply twisted about this scene. Make no mistake. And it continues at around 8.30 a.m., the time I'm usually on my way up to the butcher's cafe, to be honest, Verse 20 says that Jesus is actually being led out to be butchered, to be crucified. That's verse 20. And then Simon comes along. I don't know if you noticed Simon in the story that was read for us. So apparently, we don't know where he'd been. He'd been out of town, maybe he was on a holiday, maybe he was visiting his mother-in-law, we don't know. But anyway, he he comes back in with the morning rush, Simon's heading back into town as they are heading out of town, and then he gets roped into carrying this cross. I thought, it's a little bit like if you walked past a neighbour's house and they're moving, and before you know it, you're helping some bloke named Neil move his piano down the stairs. Like, kind of catches him by surprise. But Simon, he doesn't carry anything downstairs, but he does carry this bit of wood 500 metres roughly up to Galgotha. So that's a little bit like walking from this front door down to Manly Wharf. It's actually not that far, probably a little bit further than that. So it's not far, but I thought, far out. Is this a case of wrong place at the wrong time for Simon? The more I reflected on that question, I thought, no, it's not. It's it's right place at the right time for Simon. And I want to tell you why. Not because he got a free workout, but because God did an amazing workout in his family after this. I don't know if you noticed that his kids are mentioned here. And details matter in this timeline. They matter in this story because Mark, he's not just writing interesting history or an interesting story. He's writing, he's writing incredible history. Details really matter. And historically, we know that Rufus, Simon's boy, became a Christian. Something happened on this day to this young man that changed his life forever. He became a Christian. Good Friday for him Being there was not a day, just another day to eat hot cross buns or go off to church or eat a little less meat or no meat at all. No, this was a day when he witnessed and he watched and he thought deeply for himself about what took place in his, as he was watching on or as his father described it to him later. We're not exactly sure. And it took his breath away to see what Jesus did for him. It changed his life. And that is many of you. Perhaps it's not all of you. So this is what I see. I wonder what you see. You see, the the story continues. Jesus keeps moving with this mass of soldiers. Now, on Monday, I was actually idling in my car just at um, Whistler Street, I think it was, uh, the intersection of Sydney Road, actually, and Belgrave Street. And a bunch of police motorbikes, they went in front of me and top and tailing these three beautiful black Range Rovers were 
some police cars, and I was sitting in my CRV just idling there, and I thought, oh, there's an important delegate in town, obviously. So that was Monday in Manly. This is Friday in Jerusalem, and the delegate of heaven is in town. And he, he has a convoy of his own, but this is not a convoy to protect, but to punish. This is not, this is not a police squad to help, this is a, a death squad to hurt. For the king of heaven. And so at 9am, the death squad that held him drove the nails that held him. Jesus was crucified. Two crooks beside him, nothing could guide him, nothing could hide him, no kind voice to guide him. He had a message above him that was brutal and mean, mocking from below as people worked as a team. At 9.30 a.m., they divided his clothes. He would have watched it from up there, just right in front of his nose. The pain, nails so deep, no chance he'd fall. I can't believe he knocked back the myrrh, an ancient paracetamol. For an hour and a half, he hung in the sun, minute after minute, but this wasn't close to being done. At 11 a.m., he had a conversation with a con, You'll find that in Luke if you thought Mark got it wrong. So like a fly on the wall, we get to hear it all. Jesus offers forgiveness to this brute who would brawl. And then verse 33, did you see? It got dark, it got eerie. At midday, at noon, it just went black, like a night with no moon. In the middle of the day, it's hard not to say that the judgment of God shook creation that day. When he cried to his father, he couldn't have been father. He was on his own, the judgment pressing harder and harder. It was 3 p.m. when our Jesus breathed his last, and in the spiritual realm, it was nuclear, like a bomb blast. You see, this is the moment that Satan would say, go on, check it out, I took out a king today. I'm not sure when it was that Satan started to run, I think it's when he realised that Sunday would come. And that's the thing about Mark 15. There's so much going on, much of it unseen. But this is what it took for you to be clean. This is a timeline of terror, but it is a timeline of triumph. It is gruesome, but it is glorious. It is brutal, but it is beautiful. It is brutal because the one who was perfect died so horribly. It is beautiful because he did it deliberately for you. That's Good Friday. And please don't see him as weak or woeful. Please see him as willing and wonderful. I, I thought, and, and, and this is in the scriptures, at any moment he could have rung the bell of heaven and these 600 soldiers would have stood face to face with 6 million angels. Please don't see him as weak. See him as willing and wonderful that this had to happen. The perfect one punished in our place for our sin. The cross is chaotic, but it is a clear message of God's love for the world. This is God on the loudspeaker, that he cares This terror is him showing the world our Lord's triumph over Satan, sin and death. That's what I see. I wonder what you see. People say that what took place on this wooden table in 1938 changed the world. God says what took place on this wooden cross in 33 AD changed the world and for good. And for good. The shockwaves of this event run across humanity and will run across human history forever. And I know that because it is rattling the hearts of people in this very building today. Extraordinary. The news that the sun was struck so the sinner could be saved. That's what I see. I don't know if you noticed, but in the end... There, verse 39, the, uh, the leader of the death squad. So he, he is the guy who drove the nails and he's driven to his knees. 
he sees this man die and he doesn't offer just He doesn't offer nice words like you might in a eulogy at a funeral. He offers worship to this man. He bows before the man he literally put on the cross six hours earlier. From executioner to worshipper. That is how quickly Jesus can change a life. The first couple of converts are criminals. And they are both welcomed. Now, you may not be a criminal, but I'm sure you, like me, you have a history. And friend, you are welcomed. You are welcomed. And it was our sin that put him there. That is the mind-blowing, head-bending mercy of Jesus. It is remarkable, it is radical, but it is accessible. And it is ours, it is yours, if you want it. That's what I see this Good Friday. I wonder what you see. Friends, as we reflect on this, we're going to stand, we're going to sing our final hymn. My song is Love Unknown. And just to reflect on what took place all those years ago for you. So please, let's stand together and we'll sing our final hymn.
Please be seated. Just as we come to take the, uh, the Lord's Supper together, I, just, I feel to pray just to prepare ourselves as we, as we do that. Our wonderful, wonderful Heavenly Father, we come before you as your children, so deeply thankful for what you have done for us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who died in our place for our sin so that we could have a real relationship with you. Father, I pray that we would be so moved by that news, so moved today that it just brings forth worship in us. But Father, would you help us to reflect well on the weightiness of this, that we might have joy in our hearts as we look to our Saviour and what it is that Jesus has done for us. And Father, we pray this, that you might get all the glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. Well, friends, um, having gone through that timeline of the... Uh, from the morning to the afternoon that Jesus was crucified. We're going to wind back to the evening before and, and share together now in the Lord's Supper. It will help if you've got one of these communion packs. If you didn't get one on the way in, please raise your hand. And uh, Ken and Chris and others have got one that they'll bring to you. In the meantime, for those of you who aren't familiar with our communion packs, um, it's got a couple of parts to it, a couple of seals. It'll help right now if you take the two seals off very top one, which will give you access to the little piece of bread, a wafer. And there's a, a second foil seal. Once you've taken that off, you'll have access to the juice. So friends, it was a timeline of terror uh, that Pete walked us through this morning that the scriptures describe for us on the day that Jesus was crucified, but none of this took God by surprise long before he'd announced it, and on the evening before Jesus was crucified, sitting down with his disciples at what was the ancient Passover meal celebrated once a year, he used the elements of that traditional meal which pointed back to a great act of salvation that God had done in the past. He used them to point forward to the salvation that he would achieve by going to the cross. What we're doing this morning in the Lord's Supper is we're joining together in a simple ceremonial meal which recalls the last meal Jesus shared with his disciples. In sharing it together, we remember that we are completely undeserving of God's love Yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to everlasting life as God's sons and daughters, our Saviour Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. So in remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, we share in this meal. We, We take this opportunity to examine ourselves and to amend our lives, coming with penitent hearts and steadfast faith. Above all, giving thanks to God for his love towards us in our Lord Jesus. So we'll join together in these words of confession as we come before our righteous and merciful God in prayer. Please join me in this prayer of confession. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and desires of our own hearts and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who repent according to the promises declared to us 
through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives of your holy name. Amen. Friends, we read in the scriptures from the prophet Isaiah that he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The scriptures describe what took place on that night before the cross. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it Then he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'll lead us in a prayer. We thank you, our Father, that in your love and mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our salvation. By this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and commanded us to continue a remembrance of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may spiritually be partakers of his body and blood. So let's, let's take this little piece of bread And as we do so, let's eat it in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And would you take up the little cup? And as we drink, let's drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for us and be thankful. Please join me as we pray a prayer of thanksgiving for all that God has done for us in Christ. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. I'll lead us in the rest of the prayer. Dying and living, he declared your love gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. Share his body, live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to... We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. Well, friends, we've all but uh, finished our service today, but there's a few things that I'm going to share with you uh, in relation to what's coming up and uh, one very practical thing uh, that I'm going to plead your help with. And uh, once I've shared these things, uh, I'll get you to stand and I'll pronounce a blessing. Uh, But firstly, I do want to welcome again those of you who who are guests with us who maybe aren't normally at church or in particular here at St Matthew's. It's been wonderful to have you joining us today. I'll just let you know that on Sunday um, we get to hear the rest of the story and we see why what Jesus did on the cross was so wonderful and how we can know that it was the day that changed everything as he 
as the, as the disciples discover the empty tomb. And our senior minister, Bruce, will be helping us understand how the hope of Christians is grounded in the reality of history and what took place then. But especially for you, if, um, if you are a guest with us, if some of this is unfamiliar, uh, we're, we're just reading from the end of the story of Jesus in the Gospels, but we've got a whole stack of copies of the Gospel. We'd love it if you'd take one with you. You could actually read this from the beginning to the end before Sunday, and that would be a wonderful thing to do, to, to hear the whole story of, of Jesus in this, um, in this short Gospel. Um, there at the back, and please take one with you. The second thing I'll say is um, we'd love it if you'd reach out and let us know that you've been here. And um, you'll find in the seat, underneath the seat in front of you, a little card like this. We call them our connection card. And the kind of thing you can connect with us about is just to say hello. Uh, there might be something you'd like us to pray for you or some other way in which we could help or a question that you've got. Uh, please just scan that and um, we'll get back to you through the week. Uh, the other thing is, uh, so, so read something, uh, re reach out, and, and do come back, not just on Sunday, but we've got, we've got church every Sunday, uh, four services on the Sunday, and, and this year, this, this Easter, Easter for us is extending a little bit into next week. Uh, we're running a thing called the Mark Drama, uh, which is a, a, a performance of the whole of Mark's Gospel. A little team from the church are getting ready to put that on next Friday night and Saturday night. It'll be a wonderful thing to, to come along to. We'll be set up in the round. It'll be um, a, a wonderful opportunity to hear again uh, the message of Jesus. Uh, so you do need to buy a ticket for that. Go online at St Matthew's. They're just $5 each. Uh, that's Friday night and Saturday night. All of the details are on our website. So um, take something to read, uh, reach out, and come back again, return, we'd love to see you again. Look, the, the practical thing that would be very helpful for us today is we're expecting quite a crowd at, um, at 10 o'clock and a lot of them are expecting to park in a car park and it would be terrible if your car uh, means they can't get there. So if you're ducking off for a coffee or something like that afterwards, maybe you could move your car first to somewhere else so that others can use the car park. That would be very helpful. Look, would you stand? And uh, let's not have all those instructions ringing in our ears, but how good is it to hear what that Roman centurion saw? How did he have that insight, given the backstory that he will have had, given everything that's unfolded that day? I suppose God opened his eyes so that he can see in this poor man being crucified and the whole way that he carried himself, surely you're the son of God. And so that, that those words came from a Roman centurion. Surely this man was the son of God. Friends, with that statement in, in our minds and having walked through that timeline of Jesus going to the cross, may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen.